to and how do I start the show again? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, dear listener, to the After Movie Diner. I'm, I've been almost 200 episodes, Mo, and I still can't get used to just going into the show. Every, every week, Jim has to, like, tell me what to say. But basically, hello and welcome, everybody listening, to this week's After Movie Diner. And a special episode, uh, because we have back in the saddle, as it were, uh, me old beardy compadre, uh, Moses Porn, how are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm doing great. See, this is the great thing about uh, about No Budget Nightmares is that we established like uh, an opening so long ago that like it's it's permanently ingrained in my brain, and I'll never forget it except the weeks that I do. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I could, I, you know, I suppose I could come up with a, a, an intro. And normally, to be fair, when we do our because. Uh, Regular listeners of the Diner will know that, that uh, uh, Mo normally comes on on the New Year's Eve episodes. And on the New Year's yeah. Eve episodes, yeah. I normally... You can't, you can't handle me more than once a year. <laughs> I can handle you whenever you want um, blah, blah. Uh, in the Pantle region. Uh, but no, I, uh, I normally write a big intro for everybody um, to start off that show. Today I didn't. Today uh, I was too busy making myself dinner, eating dinner... And then uh, editing some videos for the website because uh, my big behemoth of a website now just requires all of my attention. Apparently, it's my second job. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how it works. Yeah, essentially. So uh, don't forget to go over to the After Movie Diner and support the After Movie Diner in any which way you possibly can. Uh, if you're listening to this, uh, I know that August is Share Month. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just encourage people to share stuff. If oh, you s- I, okay. I thought you meant like turn back time. Oh, like- no, no. That's been the running gag in the yeah. show. Oh, I've, been, okay. I've been playing that song every time I say it, Share Month. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, w- uh, when you hear this noise... If I could turn back time If I could find a way I'd take back When you hear that noise, we want you to share. So if pe- people always say, if you see it, report it, or whatever they what, what do they say? <laughs> if you see something, say something. See something, say something. That's it. I'm all over the place, Mo. I'm not ready. I'm not in my rhythm yet. I'm not in okay. my rhythm yet. I, I, I will get there. If you see something, say something. Uh, we're saying if you see something, share something. Share something, yes. That's what we're saying. If you see something, fucking share it, you Bastards. I don't know why I did the things I did. I don't know why I said the things I said. Rides like a knife, it can cut deep inside. Words are like weapons, they wound sometimes. You no good sons of whores. No good sons of whores. So, Mo. Uh, yeah. First of all, so uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit uh, about what you've been watching lately and what you've been doing and who the hell are you? Uh, uh, oh, man. Um, well, you know. Difficult uh, my, questions first. It, oh, God, I hate this question so much. Uh, well, I mean, you know, co-host for No Budget Nightmares. It's me and Doug Tilly. Uh, He's that name. Doug Tilly. That one, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's the guy who got the better theme song. Um, uh, mine's well. Although I have to, I, I can't say that. I can't say that he's got the Hong Kong Fooey parody song, which is great because it really works perfectly for Doug Tilly. But mine is a mod parody song, and that just makes me very happy. Plus, yours indi- indicates that you're always masturbating. So. Yeah, mine of course mentions masturbation. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I haven't, you know, it's funny, like, uh, I hit this year running real hard with um, with movies uh, and, and managed to get myself a good, like, month and a half ahead of my uh, one movie per day schedule. And uh, now I'm actually 
behind again because I took like I took quite literally an entire month off just to catch up on some TV shows I've been meaning to uh, to do. So lately I haven't watched a whole lot, although uh, most notably um, I, I watched that documentary about like obsessive Ghostbusters fanboys called Ghost Heads. Yeah, uh, and that was fun. Um, I mean, it focused entirely too much on just like these this one particular guy and I, I just didn't find him very interesting at all. So like anytime Hello, they... I'm yeah. Eric. Yeah. I right. sleep with a stay puff marshmallow man toy. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And it, it just, it, he's one of those guys where he just happened to be in the right place, at the right time for all of this co- sort of interesting stuff to happen to him. And, uh, and it made sort of a feel good story, but I just thought it was fucking boring as shit. So every time they cut to somebody else, I was like, oh, thank goodness I can pay attention to somebody else. But overall, I enjoyed it. What I did, um, what I didn't realize was that the right place and the right time was sticking a knob in a Slimer doll on the third <laughs> aisle of the toy <laughs> section of Kmart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The producer just happened to be shopping with his kid. He's like, "You look like a Ghostbusters fan." <laughs> he's like, "Take it, Slimer, take it." <laughs> uh, he, take he's, it. he's just like, "Hello, I'm Eric. I want to make Slimer really slimy." Pretty, mm. pretty much, yes. Nice. Yeah, uh, and then I watched. Uh, I mean, I watched Coming to America, which is always fun. Uh, I watched that thoroughly mediocre uh, Key and PL movie, uh, Keanu. Right. Um, and then just recently for the uh, for the show for No Budget Nightmares, uh, we watched uh, Tim Ritter's Killing Spree. Nice, very nice. Which, which was super fucking fun. That episode, I believe, dropped already. If not, then it'll it will by the time this one goes out. Sure. Yeah. This one, this one will go out next week sometime Monday or Tuesday. Um, yeah. Excellent. Mo. Well, thank you so much for all that information. That's tremendous. Uh, I myself did much the same as you did, sir. I hit the ground running with watching movies and letterbox stuff and blah, 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 blah. And then just fucking gave up and I've watched a whole bunch of movies. I just haven't documented which ones I've watched. That's uh, me almost every other year. Yeah, I haven't written it down. I have yet to... I uh, No, I did Letterbox once all the way through the year. But it's just, like, I just forget to put ones on. And then once I've forgotten one, I'm just like, fuck it, it's not complete. Well, you know... <laughs> <laughs> no, I no, just I go, no, I... unless it's complete, I'm not finishing it. I thoroughly understand that <laughs> entirely. Uh, my problem is, and I, I'm sure you can can relate to this as well, and Doug certainly relates to this, is that like me and Doug watch so many like super low budget, no budget, you know, uh, films throughout the course of the year for the show, and the majority of them aren't on there. So it's like, and it's such a tedious process to add them. And, like, Doug doesn't mind, but I really do. I don't care for it. So I just keep a little list on my computer, and that's, you know, and that's why half the time when I'm documenting the movies on my on Facebook, it'll just be, like, two one question marks. I'm like, I have no idea where the fuck I am in this thing. <laughs> you know? I mean, next year I have, like, I have to do it one year and, yeah. and do it properly because uh, it, would, it would just appease the kind of nerdy list taker. Uh, right, right, that, right. That dwells deep within me. Right. Um, I'm. I'm really glad that the one year I did manage to keep uh, to keep it going through the whole year was the year that I like broke my movie watching record. You know, uh, f- for whatever I did, wasn't really maintaining a list or anything like that. But that was the year that I watched something like 780 movies in in the year, and it was oh my god. Of course, I was also I was also unemployed and uh, not really looking for a job. So, you know, watching four or five movies a day wasn't that yeah. big a deal. Well, the other thing is, of course, is I always feel the urge to have to write a review for each each one on Letterboxd, mm-hmm. you know. And then I'm like, OK, we can't start the next movie until I've sat there and written one. And then I'm thinking, why am I writing a review for Letterboxd? Mm-hmm. I should just put it on the website. And then it. It just becomes a big knot in my brain, and then I go right. and hide in a corner, and Kim has to throw <laughs> ice water over me or <laughs> hit, hit, hit me in the balls with a jar of peanut butter strapped to a hose pipe. I don't know where I'm going with this, but you know. <laughs> I was enjoying it. <laughs> You're enjoying the visual. I of, was of enjoying that. the visual, yes. Um, but uh, today's movie uh, that we're covering. 
uh, or this week's movie rather that we're covering is the wonderful uh, Microwave Massacre uh, yes. from 1983. And uh, it is soon to be released on an Arrow Blu-ray, which is what I watched it on. Um, but it is also hanging around on YouTube with Spanish subtitles, right, Mo? Portuguese. Portuguese. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Technical yeah. technical difference there. Um, <laughs> actually, it's a huge fucking difference. It's but, a huge difference, yeah. But no. Uh, so, yeah, we did um, uh, Microwave Massacre from 1983. Uh, starring none other than Jackie Vernon, who is famous for Fucking what, Mo? Frosty the Snowman. Frosty the Snowman. Now, oh my God! I'm sitting here watching the movie, and I like, I like, I'm not placing the voice, you know, because I wasn't particularly familiar with what uh, Jackie Vernon looked like as a human, you know. <laughs> right. um, I knew what uh, he looked like as a snowman. I knew what he looked like <laughs> as a snowman. I, uh, uh, First in part, I'm not too sure. Uh, his face plus, 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 this was also very, very late in his career. I think this is actually the second to last thing he ever did. It's actually his very last film. Uh, he might we'll have see. done TV or something afterwards, but it's his right, very right. last film, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to place the voice, and I'm like, oh, my God, this sounds so familiar. And, like, I have one of those minds where, like, if I if something's familiar to me, I'm, I need to compare it to something, and I wasn't. And I'm like, this is so goddamn familiar. Now, in now if in the movie he had said the phrase happy birthday, then I wouldn't have had an issue with that at all. But holy shit, it's fucking Frosty the Snowman. And then afterwards, when I saw the name, I'm like, oh, it was Frosty the fucking Snowman. Uh, which just made me just fucking cackle. Yeah, I mean, two things for people who don't know uh, either thing, because I think the, the, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, kind of that um, Christmas, there's like four of them, and I forget the other two, but like those Christmas animations are more famous over here, I think, than I don't know if they even play in the UK or if they do... Um, they're not that well known. Like it wasn't until I moved over here that I suddenly found out a bit about these things. Yeah, I, I have no idea how familiar anybody else in the world is, but yeah, they're they're fairly well known here. And they play every Christmas, right? You, typically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're they're a whole like Christmas animation package that play, and uh, you know, obviously you've got Charlie Brown Christmas and stuff like that. But there's. Um, uh, Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer are the two I can think of. So Jackie Vernon did the voice of Frosty the Snowman. And Jackie Vernon is sort of... He's sort of a cross between um, Rodney Dangerfield and uh, Jackie Mason. Yeah, actually, it's funny you would say that, because that's almost exactly the comparison I did when I forgot that he was Frosty the Snowman. And, yeah, he had done uh, bits on the Merv Griffith show and the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and he's sort yeah, he of was like a, a he Vegas... Was a yeah, he was like a stand-up comedian, like a lounge yeah. act. A ve- yeah, sort of a Vegas nightclub lounge act type guy. So um, we uh, the only reason I say that is to kind of set the film up, because in, in the film where he's very much kind of playing himself, uh, you know, every other line is a quip. It's not a particularly strong quip, but every other line is a quip. It's so he's sort of like a low rent uh, Bob Hope. <laughs> yeah, there. I mean, this movie is like puntacular. They're just <laughs> right. th- there are puns just constantly. There's a uh, whole sequence in the movie where he approaches a woman outside a, re- a chicken restaurant dressed as a chicken, yeah. just so that he can make a lot of chicken jokes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, like... Uh, and and somehow, thanks to movie magic, he manages to get her in bed. Yeah, no, he manages to become a ladies' man at one point in the movie. But uh, And if you see him, he has a face that looks like a bag full of asses. <laughs> he, he looks like somebody took a sack of Valencia oranges uh, to... Uh, what's his name? Oh, God, fucking Polly from the Rocky movies. <laughs> you know... Yeah, I Bert, mean, it's Bert a, Young. Bert Young. Yeah, that's exactly what he looks like. Uh, yeah, he looks like Bert Young was allergic to bees and got <laughs> <laughs> got caught in an apiary. Um, yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, that's pretty pretty much what he looks like. Um, and Microwave Massacre is it, it's one of those sort of for me a kind of gleeful discovery because it's it's. It's not a good movie, yet somehow it's a delightful movie. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> ab- ab- absolutely. No, no, this movie is a horrible piece of shit. 
Um, it's uh, like thoroughly sexist, uh, very insensitive, uh, and just. And there's a couple of moments where it's completely racist for no reason either. Like it just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unnecessary racism. Yeah. But but it's such like this movie is as close to like an '80s teen sex horror film, you know, like like a, right. like like you know what I mean? Like it's a teen sex romp, but only it's there's no teens and it's a horror movie. Right, exactly. It definitely like I did not know what the tone was going to be until uh, the until the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> like, from the right. outside of the box or the cover, you would think, okay, this is going to be a horror movie about a guy who kills people using a microwave. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you would just mm-hmm. assume that it was going to be like that. Just right. in the same way that Nail Gun Massacre, you would assume, is about a guy who kills people with a nail gun. Mm-hmm. Um, and the movie starts on a pair of breasts, an enormous pair of bouncing breasts, uh, walking breasts. down the street. Well, the movie mm. actually starts with like a, a clip of the big microwave, and then the light comes on, and there's a head in it, right? Y- yeah, yeah. Um, but then after that, it immediately cuts to breasts, and over the top of the breasts, it's like microwave massacre, and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Like all of us, <laughs> if it was called, you know, um, I don't know, teen blanket bingo. <laughs> <laughs> microwave massacre then it would just be like that would be fine if it was called beach blanket ma- microwave massacre then then you would be like okay um and and because they started like that what's hilarious is that the the storyline such as it is begins with this guy who's a construction worker unhappy with the food that his wife cooks him for dinner and the sandwiches that she sends him to work with I love the sam- that first sandwich that he has, <laughs> where it's just like it's like two pieces of just like the stalest looking loaf, you know. Yeah. Uh, they're hard as rocks, and in it is just an entire crab. A lot, yeah, a huge whole crab. A whole crab still in shell. Yeah, with some lettuce. And yeah. and so he's he's down and out about the food that he's being prepared. And the reason why I bring that up right away is because the original opening of the movie was going to be May, his uh, uh, both terrible but also put upon wife, because he's horrible to her as yeah, well. Yeah, he's a he's a huge pile <laughs> of shit. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, she's not very nice either. Of it, like. You know, he married her, you know what I mean? So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying. I mean, or is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I she's said that wrong. Trying. She's trying. Yeah. She's he's tr- just being a fucking cunt to her. So the original plan was to film her buying a variety of hideous things in a supermarket. And then as she threw it into the basket, there was going to be a label on each item that was going to be the opening credits. Oh, that's awesome. Right. So, but the supermarket backed out at the last minute. Right? The supermarket was like, no. And then I think the director jokes in the in the making of that's on the disc. He's like, they probably read the script. <laughs> right. But right. what's hilarious about this whole story is that when the supermarket uh, backed out and they couldn't do the opening, they sent the actress playing May home, and instead went, "How can we open the movie?" <laughs> And their solution to opening a movie about a man who kills his wife with a microwave because of the terrible food she makes and then finds out that he prefers eating humans, which is the actual plot of the movie, Mm -hmm. the way they decided to open it was titties. If it fails... titties (laughs) titties <laughs> and 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 frank and frankly i applaud i i applaud their decisions but it's just can you imagine that like they're all sat around the table and they're like fuck then we can't get the supermarket we can't go what are we gonna do and then one of the guys around the table either takes a swig from a bottle or a puff of a joint or both and just goes yeah. titties titties can we get titties <laughs> <laughs> Johnson's got an idea. What do you got? Uh, titties. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, and the other the other thing is that uh, they wanted um, Rodney Dangerfield. They actually wanted Rodney Dangerfield for the role, but his asking price was too high, apparently. Yeah, well, you know, 
sixteen dollars in a joint is a lot of money. <laughs> but it's uh, what what what's hilarious is is that on in the making of they were like. We wanted Rodney Dangerfield for the role. And then just in a very quiet voice, he just goes, Jackie Vernon was our second choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, that's such a shitty thing to say because these were a bunch of guys. That got, the guy who directed it, um, these were a bunch of guys. Uh, his dad had worked as a script supervisor on, on mm. like... 500 Hollywood movies like he was just some guy that they brought on the on the set a lot to sort of coach actors and look nice. at the script and various other yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. so the guy had grown up on set and he was like so I'm going to start making movies myself um, and then all the others were just kind of like college buddies of his uh-huh. so like he has a tangential link to Hollywood but like Jackie Vernon at the time was you know he was he wasn't uh, Rodney Dangerfield, and he wasn't Bob Hope, but he was a, you know, he had a career. Like, he was a f- person they could get for the movie. He was an entity. Right, exactly. So this yeah. this idea that they're like, that he was a, he was our second choice. Like, I'm like, fuck you! <laughs> like, you got a, you got a name dude. You got right. a dude who had been on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson to be in your movie. Like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> um... So yes, yeah, yeah, man, you got Frosty the fucking snowman. Right, you got Frosty the fucking snowman to uh, <laughs> do all sorts of horrendous things in your film, and and yeah. it is his film. Like there are lots of other stuff going on, but it follows him ninety six percent of the time. Yeah, he is. He is. In, there are very few moments in this film when he's not like center stage where he's not the main thing happening in that scene which is pretty impressive when you think about it yeah definitely yeah. definitely especially considering like an actor he's not like he's not even Don Rickles and you know Don Rickles is a great actor when he needs to be but like he's not even watchable in a Don Rickles way like right, right. And, and it's clear that no one's like no one's coaxing a performance out of him you know what I mean like no one's saying hey man can we try that again like no one said that on this set at all, you know, and 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 as true as that is, it's it's surprising at how few like line flubs there are. Because you know, like mo- a lot of movies, like even in like uh, Killing Spree, uh, there was a real, there was at least one real serious line flub, and we're like, why didn't Tim Ritter just do a second take there? But I guess he liked that one, you know. Uh, in this one, there it's there's not not from Jackie Vernon at least. There's a million from other characters, but not from him. Right, exactly. No, I I, I agree. Okay, so yeah, so that's a little bit of sort of behind the scenes stuff about Microwave Massacre. Um, why don't you start taking us through it then, then, sir? Okay. Uh, so yeah, like we said, the film opens up with uh, with a panning in shot of the monstrosity of a cardboard mi- uh, microwave. Yeah. Um, it man, whew, that microwave is nothing to fucking joke about. The thing's bigger than most ovens. Yeah, and we should point <laughs> out here the effects in this movie are not good. Like the the effects are, are not good. No. Like, comically not good. Um, yeah. And I, listen, I don't like to watch movies um, uh, ironically. And the, and, the, and the nice thing about this movie, the thing that I liked about it, is because they were so clearly using humor from the very beginning, both in the way he was talking, but also in the fact that the movie's titles are literally over a large pair of boobs. Yeah. You just kind of go, okay, I can laugh at it because they're making, they know they're making a comedy. Right. Um, And also, in terms of the effects, which are sort of the body parts, that's really the only effects we're talking about. In terms of the body parts, because it's not horrific and it's not really meant to, it's it's meant to be funny, um... uh, they're more just to kind of symbolize the idea rather than to be realistic in any way. <laughs> yeah, like they don't need to be realistic, you know, as such. I mean, they're essentially the those plastic body by like wean stores. There's nothing super fancy about, about any of them. But yeah, so anyway, so yeah, the, the movie starts with this horrible effect, and then it goes into boobies, and then, and then it goes and then it goes right to boobs, and then it goes right to fucking just these 
jackass fucking construction workers who are just the horniest motherfuckers you know well, like, it, it, like there's a there's a genius bit which is that there's a white guy and a black guy listening to the radio and chowing down on their sandwiches right and the white guy is like hey man you have to feel the music like the joke is the black guy who would normally obviously have the rhythm and the ability and understand music and all the rest of it right right like doesn't know how to what's the line he says like he says you got it you got to pretend like you're a willowy tree and just <laughs> and let the breeze take you, man. No, but he says – he the white guy says something about like um, you're a novice at getting down or you're a – Oh, yeah, An yes. amateur at the funk or something like that. Something like that, that. yeah, know. yeah. But it's a hilarious line and the whole joke that a white guy is teaching a black guy about music. Um, and then explain to me, Mo, because I'm not sure I fully understood. <laughs> <laughs> what? What happened with the boobies? <laughs> All right, so so for some reason, this woman, the uh, the title shot uh, titties, um, the uh, titty shot? No, never mind. Yeah. Uh, she for some reason decides oh, no, you could that... you could say the titular shot. You could say ah, that. Ah, yes, her. Um, she decides for some reason that she's going to peek through this conveniently breast-sized uh, hole in the wall where they're building whatever. Um, and uh, as she peeks in, this uh, this this not-so-decent gentleman pinches her bottom and it forces her breasts into <laughs> the hole where she, of course, wiggles uh, to try to get herself free, which pulls open her shirt, and now there's just titties in a hole. And, but what's uh, weird is is that there seems that, that it cuts back twice to her fr- from behind her, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't see the hand on her ass anymore, so it's not like he's like. Oh, there's nothing. There's nothing holding her, her in the hole. No, it's but just... she's just like bouncing back and forth. Yeah, as if like as if someone's having sex with her almost. Like that's how she's like moving back and forth. But See, I took, it as, I took it as her struggling to break free. Well, I think that's a good way to to look at it, and I think yeah. it's important that we. I'd rather I'd rather pretend that she's not being raped on the street. Right. But... I just well, no, that's not what I thought was happening. I just <laughs> said it, it looked like it, but there was no one doing anything. So I was right, like, right. well, that's obviously not what's happening. Yeah, but yeah. then, in which case, what's happening? And I think that maybe had she done a Jim Wynorski. Mm-hmm. And added that rubber balloon sound of right. the breasts, yep. then I would have understood that they were stuck. Um, like, had there been like that <laughs> <laughs> noise, which which Winorski adds in the shower scene in Sorority House Massacre 2. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> when she's showering and she rubs her hand over her breast, you hear or- like this <laughs> noise, like a squeaky <laughs> balloon noise. <laughs> um, really? Which is no, I mean that is Winorski's genius. Let's yeah, not yeah, yeah, let's yeah, not yeah. downplay that. <laughs> um but yeah, I feel like had they done that here, had they had they had some foley sounds to indicate that they were stuck, I would have understood more what was going on. As it is, I was just like, This is ridiculous. <laughs> Right, right, and like you know, and, and her, and the the best part about the whole thing is that like her breasts magically get repositioned in there as well, so like you can see them better. Right, exactly. Yeah. They... And, and oh my god, and the guy's reaction to it is perfect too. So it's not like it's it's not like oh, there's somebody stuck in the fence. I should go help them. They're like, let's race to the breasts to see who gets to touch them first. <laughs> yeah, this construction site, by the way, where no one is constructing anything. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a mound of dirt surrounded by fences, and at one point we see a muscular man who turns out to be effeminate, let's say, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, lifting a girder, and that's it. Like yep. that's all the construction we see. At no point does anyone have any bricks or uh, paste or anything like that. It's just three guys sat on a dusty mound. <laughs> well, it, they they focus on lunchtime, right? They focus on the feeding time. That's kind of right. what the movie's all about. So yeah, so then we're introduced to uh, what's his name, Don, Donny, Donald. Oh, Jackie Vernon's character, yeah, is Donald, yeah, Donald, yeah. 
uh, we're, we're introduced to Donald, who, as we said previously, was uh, eating a ridiculous crab sandwich. Um, he tries to make a trade. Uh, I love I love that he just so desperately wants nothing more than just a bologna and cheese sandwich. Like I just I just <laughs> want a I just want a bologna and cheese sandwich, you know. Um, and then we we find out uh, when he gets home that 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 evening uh, exactly why he's you know I mean obviously we we learned about his his wife's uh, culinary ways, but. He has a he does have a great line when he gets home where he talks about how uh, how the food matches the chairs. <laughs> right. You know, and he says, he, "Oh yeah, it looks really great, May. The food matches the chairs." <laughs> you know, and then he says, uh, and then he he says something to the effect of, um, "He says you uh, he says with your cooking, you'd make a really great designer." Right. And, I, and it's such it's I mean, and it's like that lines like that make it make it pretty clear that that Dangerfield wanted to be their their first choice because uh, that is such a Dangerfield line. But it's really funny, you know. Oh, yeah. no, I mean, he doesn't like what's odd about it is his delivery is a little too slow right. and it's not quite. But there are a couple of moments where you're just like really laughing along with the film and enjoying the film because he. He does nail enough of the lines that it makes you go either like, oh, do, you know, like, wah, 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 or right, right. actually, like, laugh at it. And the whole scene where he comes home, you know, it's not clear because neither actor, uh, neither Claire Ginsberg, who plays May, or Jackie Vernon, has particularly a clear speaking voice. So it's not, <laughs> it's not 100% obvious just what's going on. Um, but essentially, she's tried to cook some Parisian food, like she pronounces it like uh, like manger de la Parisienne or something. Like she <laughs> she pronounces it in a really ridiculously stupid way. But she's tried... it's cordon blue. Oh, that's it, cordon bleu. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so they're trying to. She's tried to do that. He's like. He's just like, I don't want any of your fucking food. I want some, uh, just some meat and potatoes, basically. He just, he just keeps going on. He's, and he goes, I just want something simple that can be eaten with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she tries to create a romantic atmosphere um, and instead sets fire to the oil lamp, which then has to be put out with the spritzer water, what well, a seltzer water. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's what does he what does he say the atmosphere is like? He's like, uh, oh yeah, really great atmosphere you made, May. Like it's like an abattoir or something like that. Like a uh, yeah, I, I don't recall. Like like I said, there there were so many quips and one liners to try to remember them all. Would it's just a monumental Herculean task? Yeah, it just it just wouldn't work. Um, and I you know I, I before we even go any further, I would definitely suggest that people. If people like low budget um, 80s movies with quips and tits and a sort of slight horror edge, I would either pick this up or watch it on YouTube. Like, it is worth it. Yeah, because this came out right in the golden age of the 80s teen sex romp. So it's clearly heavily influenced by that style of movie. Uh, it's just instead of like attractive teenagers in all the roles or attractive twenty somethings, it's this fat old dude. Right. <laughs> so it's yeah. So it's great for me being a fat old dude myself. You know that uh, that that at least I know somebody's you know getting some. <laughs> of course he's of course he's killing them afterwards. But right. uh, you know uh, which which we'll get to. But yeah. So he. Uh, it, they have a sort of back and forth. He um, pulls out the uh, vacuum cleaner bag and empties its contents all over the living room. He urinates in the living room at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. This, this is this is at, this is when he gets to his breaking point. There's there is a ser <laughs> there's a series of events that sort of happen up to that where he's just sort of fed up with her and. Uh, and yeah, he he decides he's gonna messy up the house, and he does decide to just piss in the living room, which is pretty fucking fantastic. And she doesn't uh, really kind of get angry with him. No, she's she <laughs> seems to have the patience of a saint. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Yeah, I mean, it's a chauvinistic uh, piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, no, he is a 
full on just male chauvinist fucking piece of crap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's around this time, I think, in between the two scenes with his wife, where we get to meet the bartender at the local strip joint that they go back to a few times. <laughs> yeah, the fucking bartender who just, like, I love how he, like, takes that bartender trope and just turns it on his ear where he's like, I don't want to hear your stories. <laughs> right, no, well, this was the great thing is that the, throughout the movie... Uh, there's a couple of things going on where, like, all the characters that he meets along the way seem to have these little uh, sort of quirks or manner or, or like, characteristics right, that right. kind of make them pop a little bit for the sort of few scenes that they're in. And yeah. what I loved about that is sort of that's how I would write a film. Like, I would write a film that if our protagonist went into... If I was writing a comedy film... If our protagonist went into a um, hardware store, the guy behind the counter would be like this quirky fucking guy and would have like a few one-liners. And the bartender would be like this jokey kind of guy. And the nice thing, like you say, is he's got no time for like hookers who are in there. He doesn't want to look at pretty women or anything like that. He's got no time for hearing anybody's stories whatsoever. (laughs) He doesn't want to sit down. He's got hemorrhoids, so that's why he took a job standing up. Like there's... There's all this stuff about it. Like, nobody comments on the fact that it's a strip joint. Um, so it's it's just, he doesn't know, like, he doesn't even know how to mix cocktails, right? He's just like, this isn't a cocktail bar or something at one point, right? Right, right, right. So he's, he's and I love him. Like, I, I was like, oh, this movie is endearing itself to me because it's, yes, it's got bad acting. Yes, it's got the production, you know, values of a, a, a 1975 business film. Um, but you know, uh, shot in Des Moines. Um, uh-huh. But like, it's endearing itself to me because the script is at least attempting to keep me entertained with a bunch of like stupid characters. <laughs> right, exactly. At, at the very, at the very least, you know. And, and and me and Doug talk about this all the time. That like, it's very easy to forgive a bad film if it's like if it seems like like if if it's good enough to make you like have fun with it or if it seems like the cast is having fun with it and it does seem like these guys were having fun with their roles you know that it's easy to forgive like little shit like you know product lack of production value or or shitty acting you know as long as you're having fun with it and yeah i think i think this was a was a super fun film with a a lot of little quirky shit going on and like every character you meet is is just a little weirder than the last one and you know, it's 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 a lot of fun. I really I really like it. And the and the funny thing is, is this this uh, crew uh, started off making like training films and business films and things like this. And the movie does, in it, even in its spruced up um, Blu-ray uh, version, you know, it looks like a late seventies training film. <laughs> like it looks like you know how to use your microwave by uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's G blo- it's, or whatever you know. Yeah, it's it's blocked in a in that sort of constant medium headshot, you know, sort of or just like upper body where that's all you really ever see. So yeah, I get that. I get that entirely. And there's also the I, there's also that thing in the film where they have they don't quite understand, or they didn't have the the wherewithal to shoot coverage or cutaways. <laughs> like there's so many times in the movie where I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> it's, because, <laughs> it's because now look in this movie it's forgivable because this was a bunch of first timers and an old guy who is just like in it for the free tits probably. Um, but it's unforgivable in Star Trek Beyond, which is what we covered last week on the show, and I have similar <laughs> comments about. Um, but but it's it's sort of perfectly forgivable in this. But there are a bunch of scenes where you go, sorry, what's going on? And then, like, two minutes later, your brain catches up and goes, oh, all right, that's what they were trying to do. You know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. Like, right. with the titties, when they got stuck in the fence, I'm just like, I don't know what that was. I'm glad they were titties, but I don't know what that was. <laughs> a, a plus for titties. <laughs> D, D minus for... Uh... Like, if she had just said a line of dialogue, like, I can't get my titties out. Right, like, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All you needed was one reaction shot of her saying something, and it would have made the whole thing make sense. Yeah, or help, help, 
I'm stuck, you know, or something. Yeah. Um, he could have fucking ADR'd it, no problem. So he uh, gets pissed off with his wife. Uh, uh, you know, at this point, he's just like, I've had enough. And he kind of strangles her to death, right? Yeah. Uh, kind of strangles and or suffocates her to death. And it was a fairly, like, what was disappointing to me was that there was this great, that one of the bits which I thought was really great was he, at one point, seemingly picks up a sword and yeah, goes yeah, to yeah. hack his wife in half. And then the sword becomes a newspaper and you turn out it was just like wish fulfillment in his head. Yeah, it was a fantasy. A fantasy sequence. Um, I was actually disappointed that the first kill of the movie was was sort of bloodless and although you see his face essentially off screen because you don't see her being strangled at all you just see him like sweating right. and going red faced at the camera actually almost every single kill in this movie is disappointing yeah it almost, is almost every single one um, if, not, if not every single one <laughs> And there is a bit of gore and Gru later on in the movie. Uh, and there's a couple of moments where, because of the kind of sickly, yellowy, greeny 70s color palette that mm. it has, um, that him kind of soaring through the bones and things like that and, and sort of blood splattering in his face was a little nauseating. Not because it was scary or realistic, but just kind of nauseating. I can't quite put my <laughs> finger on it, but there was like, there was a little thing that was sort of nauseating. Do you know what I mean? I've had many women say that to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do know what you mean, though. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 just it it turned my stomach less because of what it was attempting to do. And more because of what it actually was, which was a fat, sweaty guy <laughs> <laughs> and naked chicks in a room, which probably, let's be fair, smelt like gone off ham. Yeah, I'm uh, not. I'm not. I'm not going to lie. The uh, the intimate moments in uh, in this film are incredibly hard to watch. Yeah. So he yeah. he basically figures out that after killing his wife. Um, and getting confused because his wife has all this wrapped up meat for her um, cooking in the basement fridge. Yeah, yeah. And he wraps her, he saws her body up and wraps her body up in tinfoil with no um, intention of eating her. But then later gets hungry, goes down and, and goes, okay. And, yeah. But I, I, yeah, so yeah, he, I love the fact that he, you know, so as he's leaving one of like the, the tinfoil with her hand in it, falls into the garbage can. So when he goes back later to get something to eat, instead of grabbing something out of the fridge, he grabs something out of the garbage can. Well, because he just... thinks that he's put her in the fridge and all the old meat in the garbage can. Right, and I totally get that. That's that's fine, but yeah. it's like, like, why would you... Like, why would you pick out of the trash to eat? Whatever, that's beyond the point. Uh... <laughs> but he ends, up, he, he ends up eating his wife's hand. He ends up and... eating... Her hand, yeah. And it ends up being the nicest thing he's eaten all month or all year or whatever. Um, so he realizes that he has become a cannibal and he has a taste for human flesh. It's got such a unique flavor. Um, and it's clearly, like you say, a hand that you can buy in a Halloween store. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, not even a good Halloween store, like a pop-up Halloween store. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah this, like Phantom. <laughs> like one of these things that moves into an abandoned mall space for three exactly, weeks. Exactly, exactly. Um, and has the shitty, like, $10 toys. Um, but no, so he he's basically eating a bit of rubbery ham off the top of this fake hand. <laughs> and decides, okay, so what I need to do is uh, kill women and eat them, essentially. Yeah. Um, but then he finds out that uh, the the meat is even better after he's had sex with them. Yeah, see, now this is the part that I actually really enjoyed, which <laughs> is a really terrible way to phrase that. But I, I got such a kick out of the fact that it turns into like a sexual fetish for him. And so it's not so it's not that he's just killing and eating these people that like he's like, no, 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 I have to fuck them first and then kill them. And eat them. <laughs> right down to like quite a humorous 
uh, psychiatrist sequence right, where he right. seems to be spilling his entire story to this psychiatrist who who isn't paying attention because there's a bee in the, in the office or a fly in the office. And then he falls asleep. <laughs> then he falls asleep. It's like scenes like that. Yeah. In Dear the Film to me. Because I'm like, I love but, the fact that the psychiatrist, there was a bee or a fly, and yeah. he's more concerned with that than he is with what he's saying. Right. Because we already know what he's saying. Like, we've watched him do it. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. What he's saying is unimportant. The, the, com- <laughs> the comedy is, is the psychiatrist's reaction. Um, and, uh, and, and what's even better, too, is that when the psychiatrist wakes up, and, like, he basically, like, the guy... Uh, uh, Donald actually repeats what he said again to the now conscious doctor without so many details. He just says, like, uh, you know, in order to have sex with women, I have to eat them. You know, so, of course, he's taking that as like a cunnilingus thing. Right. And he's like, no, yeah, go for it. You know, she'll thank you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but there's a great in that in that scene in particular, there's a great line where he's like, I used to think I'd have to take a woman out for dinner before I could fuck him. Now I have to fuck him before I eat him for dinner. Like, I like, <laughs> like this. <laughs> Which yeah. I kind of like that as a line. I thought that was a good, uh, uh, you know, a good flip, a good reversal yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, joke. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of uh, moments like that. It sort of gets a bit derailed with the whole he has a pacemaker put in and... Like, yeah. I didn't quite know where all that was going. Yeah, I, I feel like they got about halfway through with sh- with uh, shooting and were like, well, so, well, since we don't really have much of a script for this film anyway, uh, how do we want to end this? And it's like, oh, yeah, right. And then they probably read something about uh, microwaves fucking with pacemakers. And were like, oh, we'll give them a pacemaker. Right, okay, that's what it is. All right, yeah, yeah. I didn't quite get the ending, but it's fine. Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, like, there, there's there's really, like, when he actually dies, like, unless you know that microwaves fuck with pacemakers, you have no idea what the hell's going on until a few minutes later, like, we're at the very end when the people who move into Donald's house, like, are looking at the wiring on the microwave and be like, oh, this would be death for anybody with a pacemaker. Oh, uh, right, 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 right. That's what it was. Okay, so I didn't actually hear that last line. <laughs> I was too busy uh, talking to Kim at that point. Uh, yeah, you were probably better off. Because uh, Kim came in halfway through the movie and she was like, I can't watch this film. I was like, why not? She's like, because it's Frosty the Snowman and he's raping and killing women. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's exactly why I wanted to watch this <laughs> Right, but she couldn't get it out of her head. Um, so so there's, there's... Happy a- birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, so there's a lot more going on in the movie. The next door neighbors seem to be having um, uh, some form of constant rotation of orgies. I my favorite moment with the neighbors, <laughs> and I'm and I'm sure it's yours too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's the very first time we see them, and the very first moment we see is the woman getting pressed up against the window. But that's not my favorite moment. No, with but them. also the fact that the guy. In the middle of that orgy, because there's four or five people at the window, yeah, clearly yeah, yeah, in the middle yeah. of the orgy, and there's a guy in um, women's, in women's underwear, underwear. Yeah, yeah. who looks disgusted at Donald, which was yeah, my yeah, favorite yeah, like, thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's just like, and then he closes the blinds, and then he's peeking back out of them just in disgust. <laughs> you go back to your normal life, normie. Uh, yeah, but no, yeah. my favorite moment with them is there's a scene where one of the myriad of women who's next door uh, is, like, doing some gardening. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of using, like, a spade or, like, you know, she's using a vibrator. She's using a vibrator to dig holes that she can then plant, like, single stem flowers in, essentially. Right, right, exactly. You know, and so and so <laughs> Donald kind of stops and he's looking at her and she's just kind of... You know, and like rubbing it on her leg and stuff, and then he just says something like, "That is one weird girl," or something <laughs> to that effect. Yeah, that I is, mean, what an odd lady. I mean, there the, 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 there are a number of scenes where you're like, "Oh, come on, you could have written a better line like that." There's, oh, there's yeah, some yeah, scenes but... where you're like, "Wow, she really gets a buzz out of gardening." Like, they could have said <laughs> that. They could have been, you know, like, "Did the earth move? Is it vibrating?" Like, there's. 
there, there was lines you could write. If they... But but I but see, but the line he actually said, I actually really laughed at because right. I just thought it was I thought it was so fucking stupid and brilliant. Like it just worked. Well, you see, like, I, I there was an issue. Pe- I think he said, "What a peculiar woman." <laughs> there was because because earlier in the in the film, uh, she's outside watering her garden with the hose, and yeah. then squats down. And it oh, right, looks right, like right. from behind that she's urinating on the garden. Yeah. Uh, and, and also considering it's coming from a hose, like continually urinating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like just it's this not massive stopping. stream. <laughs> and he sits and watches it. So, you know, it, it's, it's this world in which, you know, he's chopping women up and, and, and microwaving them. Uh, and, and she's next door having orgies and digging her garden with vibrators. In, in all honesty, like this dude, he lives in John Waters, Baltimore, basically. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's it, yeah. yeah. It does have a sort of. If it was slightly more, um, if sat- it was funnier, if it was funnier, but also like had a satirical edge, it would be right. very kind of John Waters esque. Yeah, yeah. Because it is. I mean, it's about that like um, lower middle class, working class houses filled with unhappy married couples who are jealous of the hanky-panky that's going on next door. Like, it's all that sort of, oh, the seedy underbelly of America. It's all that kind of kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, And it's it's funny, actually, because apparently uh, while they were making it, um, uh, Jackie Vernon turned to... uh, What's his name? Oh, um... Is it Lauren Sheehan who plays Roosevelt? I think so. Uh, turns to him, and uh, this is while they were making it behind the scenes, and apparently said, you know what we're making here, don't you? And he was like, what? He was like, we're making a very important film about, <laughs> <laughs> about how this modern technology is one day going to destroy us. Like, that's what he says. Like, he's, he thinks the movie is all about this idea that you know, one day uh, modern technology is going to eat us all. And it, it cuts back to Lauren, who's telling this story, and he goes, and you see what kind of a mess we're in right now? Maybe he had something, huh? And I'm thinking, <laughs> what, you mean that mess whereby I can talk to someone in England in real time in a thing that's the size of my hand that I keep in my pocket? Yeah, that really disastrously awful world that we live in, you know? <laughs> it's destroying the world. Yeah. Uh, I think it was more the well, fact... Well, somebody that... think of the children. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, my my microwave is big enough to fit fifteen people in it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of bizarre that he thought like he he agreed to be in the movie. Speaking of microwaves thought, fitting people into it, like I love the discovery because like because uh, he's in sort of a drunken stupor when he kills his wife. Uh, so it's not until the next morning that he realizes that he even did it, and he go and he just kind of stops and goes. Oh, maybe she left my din- my breakfast in the microwave. And she op- he opens up the door and he goes, "Oh no, maze in the microwave." <laughs> and she's clearly just like standing, like in a fucking like refrigerator box. Right. Uh, it's fucking brilliant. It's so stupid, but it's brilliant. And yeah. his and his line dialogue of that is fucking great too. Oh, I, oh no, no, it's not maze in the microwave. Wait a minute, what's May doing in the microwave? <laughs> and there's, there's, what? <laughs> there's like a couple of moments where he looks at the camera and one of them was absolutely spot on when she was like being all mad at him and he like looked at the camera just once uh. and I thought it was absolutely perfect. He then goes on to do it like two or three more times in the movie and it kind of ruins <laughs> the whole thing. Well, but, you'll always you'll always have that first one. But I, yeah, the first one's great. Um, so, sort of, what other? There's there's a couple of like mad like dream sequences where he's spreading mayonnaise over a woman's naked body, and then an enormous slice of bread. Yeah, goes yeah, yeah. On top of it, there's also the subplot that his. Um, uh, his co-workers are oh. enjoy like he keeps making sandwiches for his co-workers 
Yeah, yeah. So they're eating along with him, and they're they're absolutely loving it. And one of my favorite moments for that one too is they they're they're talking about this this uh, serial abductor who keeps taking women, uh, and, uh, and and they and, and they just get finished saying you know that it's in this certain area of town. It's like, oh hey Donald, don't you live in that area of town? It's like yeah, but I haven't seen any. You know, I haven't seen any strange abductions lately, <laughs> you know, which is great because it's like, what's a what's a normal abduction? Also, um, it has one of the it has one of the worst like lines in it that I'm sure at the time was fine, but now feels horrible, um, which is uh, the, 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 the moment you're talking about. And the, the black guy is reading the newspaper and he finds out that one of the women that was abducted was African-American. And he says, uh, he says, well, at least he's an equal opportunity rapist. And then laughs. Yeah, right, right, right. And you're just a bit like, you could have said abductor. You know what I mean? Like, just saying rapist just makes you go, oh. You know what <laughs> I mean? Um, and then, obviously, the whole joke is that he's like, oh, black meat today. Cause, like, yeah, it's he, like, oh, dark meat. Oh, dark meat. That's it. I right, love right. it. Uh, yeah, but that, like, that's what I'm saying. Like I love, I love that. I love that they're so like that they're eating all of this meat from him and like basically like just handing themselves clues to the fact that it's him doing it, but just like completely oblivious <laughs> to it. Right. Um, I got a kick. Then there was a weird sequence where like he says, and I don't like this. Really, was only in it to make a racist joke. Like there was no other reason to have this sequence in it. He's going out with his co-workers one night and he says, I've got to go to Chinatown first, though, to, like, pick up a chick. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then it cuts to his kitchen with the microwave on and there is, like, a geisha hairpiece and some big, like, novelty round glasses. And then oh, it just yeah, zooms yeah. into them and over the top of it has like some Chinesey style music. Yeah. And it was literally just in the movie to go, oh, Chinese people wearing big glasses. Funny joke. Like <laughs> that's the only reason it was in the movie. He needs uh, to be he needs to be careful about messing with the Chinese though, because you know, if he doesn't watch out, somebody's gonna pee pee at his coke. <laughs> Is that what he says to the film? No, 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 no. That's what I'm saying because it's a terrible joke. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> what? Where does that even come from? That's the me Chinese, me play joke, me put pee pee. Never mind. It's it's oh, very it's I very racist. I yeah. don't know that one. Oh well, you're lucky. <laughs> um, I'll cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. That's fine. Um, they, uh, there, there's a couple of other insane sort of uh, plots going. It's like, like basically every time he picks up a new woman, it's bonkers and absurd and makes <laughs> no goddamn sense. Um, I, I love the fact that May, like the ghost of May, sort of comes back and uh, and and haunts with him. So it's like it makes you wonder because the very last scene of the movie. Uh, the very last image of the movie is May with her eyes glowing, or her head, I should say. And it makes you wonder if she didn't fuck with the wiring to kill him, like, in the microwave. Like, they never expl implicitly <laughs> say it, but, like, it makes you wonder. Right, it's sort of, yeah, they, there's one sequence where he's downstairs and her head falls out of the fridge. Right, yeah. Uh, and when he goes to pick it up, it disappears. And then it keeps reappearing in other places, right. but uh, yeah. And then he, her sister shows up, Evelyn, in another running gag. Uh, finds May's. He hides May's head in the bed to make it look like she's asleep. Her sister goes in there anyway because her sister's as sort of bossy as May was. Busy, bossy, um, busy, bossy type. Yeah. Finds out that May's dead. He suddenly realizes I can't keep killing people or something like what's he gonna do with all this oh and he doesn't want to eat her meat either yeah cause... he doesn't he doesn't want to eat her right yeah. so instead he shoves a like the end of a hard baguette yeah um like an italian bread loaf and yeah into her mouth ties her up and sticks her in the cupboard yeah. and then there's this running gag 
for the rest of the movie that every time he opens the closet, she's, she's there. in there and the bread has got more moldy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's funny. I thought that was a good joke. Of and course, it, I don't know. I don't know why she wouldn't have just bit down on it, but whatever. That's that's not funny. Right. Or how she's still alive after months of not eating <laughs> uh, or drinking yeah. or anything. Um, right. But it does mean that at the end when he dies and, like, the people come in to sell the house, they find her in the closet. Like, yeah, yeah it's just <laughs> it's kind it's, of bizarre. It, it's it's a very ridiculous gag, but it's it's funny, though. There is one gag that makes that that maybe I just didn't notice something or whatever. Uh, but like, is there a moment when he starts selling the meat to like a cannibal meat company? <laughs> right. This, this another one of the, like, I, I sp- mean, this, this if, if this, if this is the scene that I'm remembering, like, this is like, I mean, this is racism on a new level. This I was going to say it's massively yeah. racist. Yeah. 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 It, it, it says something like, um, it's, it's Buana meats, like B W A N A. Buana yeah. meats. For I didn't see what it you, said. Anyway. For all you, for all your cult sacrifices, or something ah. like that, for all your cult sacrifices, and then an African American gentleman gets out of the van, dressed like, a sort of in African he, tribal. Yeah, gear. he's a tribesman. Yeah, uh, sort of one step away from having a bone through his nose, essentially. Basically, yeah. But you never see him do anything. You just see him pull up in the van, get out, and walk, away, and that's it. So it's like, yeah, exactly. Like, they never show any interactions with him and Donald. Like, it's such a throwaway gag. But it's like, man, that, like, that's one of those gags that if it had been done better, you know, like, I would have been, like, it's more forgivable because at least then it's kind of funny. Uh, But in this case, it's like, it's there just for the sake of having another racist joke there. And it's it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It really actually kind of soured me on that moment of the film. Uh, I mean, the next time we saw boobs, I was right back into it. But... Of course, no, no, the yeah, boobs yeah. do. The boobs that sort of constantly pop up throughout the movie, uh, it, you know, it, it does solve a lot of issues. The, boob, the boobs forgive, yeah, and there's yeah. plenty, and there's plenty of them. I was, I was actually very. It's ironically though, the one place you don't see boobs, strip club, right? <laughs> In the strip club, she's wearing. She's the, wearing. She's wearing like, like a, a sports bra, like it's yeah, she's like, a like a big, like thick, a, white, elasticated bra. It's not a. It's like a camisole. One. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a why weird, I know weird. very what, weird. Why I know that word is beyond me, but I do. <laughs> um, well, you're fancy, Mo. You're a fancy, I, fancy I chap. A, I am a fancy lad. Yes. You're a fancy lad about town. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any anything else in particular, like. Um, I don't know. There's just like I, it, I just found it utterly baffling that this like fat old dude, you know, just managed to to pull so many fucking like seriously foxy ladies. And uh, but I mean, I guess it's not funny if they're not attractive, right? You know, and like, two like of I, them were prostitutes. Oh, that's true. Two of them were prostitutes. Uh, some incredibly awkward sex. Uh, tons and tons of one-liners, like one-liners during sex, which is just weird. Uh, it's just constant. Like, but it's such an enjoyable movie. Otherwise, it's, I mean, not not otherwise, including all of that stuff too. It's also short. Like it's that, like that seventy-five like, minutes. <laughs> yeah, if if that, I think it's like seventy-two. But yeah, it's it's nice and short. It's the perfect length. And it's been, it- and the five, ending five minutes longer, I would have killed myself. The end. <laughs> the ending. <laughs> the ending credits are hilarious because it's all French words for like members of a kitchen. Right, right. Uh, so you don't actually know what anyone did. And then there's a credit at the end that says "dildos by sticky fingers" or "vibrator by sticky fingers." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, uh, the the copy that you sent me cuts off about halfway through the credits, so I didn't actually see that. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, but I did see the uh, the one like m- the the microwave played by or introducing microwave by as whatever. Right. I forget. It's it was silly, but you know, it's it's something to notice and kind of chuckle at, like uh, like the Lloyd Kaufman, you know, uh, jokes in the trauma credits and stuff yeah and it's it's, just something to laugh at i i think that your 
you're definitely right, and it, it definitely did remind me of those the lower end of the sort of 80s sex romp genre. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're not talking like private school for girls here. No. You know, we're we're talking like, like ah, oh, God, I can't even think of them. Just, splits. <laughs> yeah, no, spot, Splits was great. Splits is no, we're great. Ta- we're talking about like, 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 uh, like Weekend Pass. Right. Which is just an utter piece of shit of a film. Or Joysticks. Joysticks is amazing. I know, but it's... <laughs> It is a piece of shit. It's or my it's a, my tutor that kind of <laughs> right, right, exactly. Actually, my tutor is a great example because it's literally only there to showcase as, some sets of breasts. And and also, it, it's sort of it's sort of very much in the vein of Hamburger the movie. Now, Hamburger the movie is much better. Hamburger the movie is fantastic. But Hamburger the movie, in terms of like. Boobs, bad jokes, bad production values, um, but still enjoyable. So it's like hot dog. Well, no, because hot dog has like quite <laughs> high production values. I mean, it, it does. It has, it has very high production values. It's it's just a. It's really funny when you compare hot dog to hamburger. You know, <laughs> which is a great sentence to say. Yes. Um, you know, one of them has really high production values, but is not a very good movie. And then the other one has surprisingly low production values, but is just phenomenal. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I, I this, mean, this one definitely is is more the the hamburger. It's hamburger the motion picture, by the way. Uh, right, but, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's it's it's. Oh my god! Yeah, no, that's actually a pretty good comparison. Um, so we've got some questions, not a lot, but a couple of questions that I want to run through. Sure. And, and also, I want to uh, talk very quickly because we're, we're wrapping up here. But I wanted to talk about the fact that um, th- sort of this um, movie inspired me to do something a bit crazy today, which was over lunch, um, compile a list of every uh, movie that I could find online that had the word massacre in the title. <laughs> Oh, uh, see, I, I thought you were going to say you murdered a hooker and yeah. cooked her up in your microwave. And just to let everyone know that there are 145 movies that I could find that have the word massacre in the title. That's impressive. And I wrote an article about it. It's on the website. Uh, I wrote an article to accompany the list. Um, I may do like you did with your sex romp list and try and work my way through them all. And watch them. Is your yeah, sex? I, I, it's not up anymore. My it's... that that domain is gone. That whole website went. Yeah, Damn yeah. it! I know. Um... I, I probably have the list saved on like a Google Drive somewhere, so it's not like gone forever. But it's not on the it's not on the web anymore. But but some that you might like. Uh, one one of the most bizarre titles. It's actually from two thousand and has uh, Debbie Roshan in it. Nice. Um, but it's called Sandy Hook Lingerie Party Massacre. Huh. And the weird thing is, obviously, like, with the Sandy Hook thing, that takes on, like, a weird, morbid connotation now. Because, obviously, post-2012, yeah. it's sort of a bit weird. And I was, like, I was looking at it, I was, like, someone can't have made that after that, hap- that tragedy at Sandy Hook. Um, I I'm not familiar with the title, so I really I have no idea. But actually, no, it's from 12 years earlier. It's from 2000. Oh, oh. Um, but you, you know, it reminded me of those you you covered a couple on earlier in No Budget Nightmares that were sort of based on Columbine, like shortly after. Oh yeah, yeah, Duck. Yeah, and stuff like that. And I was like, shit, I hope they haven't made one like that. And they haven't. It's 12 years earlier. But just the fact that it's called Sandy Hook Lingerie Party Massacre, the first right. two words don't seem to fit the last three. Like, just call it Lingerie Party Massacre. That's yeah, all right. I don't, I don't, like, I don't, I don't understand why you needed to have the Sandy Hook in there to begin with. I mean, Lingerie Party Massacre is a great title. Right. Uh, the next one that I found, <laughs> which I have no comment for, is just called literally Big Tits Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know whether it's the massacring of Big Tits or whether it's using Big Tits to commit a massacre. I have no idea. But there is a movie in existence called Big Tits Massacre. <laughs> you know what I will say for that one is that is genius marketing. <laughs> you know, because if I just saw a movie, you know... 
called, say, you know, uh, I don't know. I can't even think of something to say. But if, like, if I'm just I'm watching some random list of movies and they all have the word massacre in the title, you know, and, and I and I'm running down that list and I see Big Tits Massacre, <laughs> I'm renting that one. That one's going first. Yeah, that one's yeah, yeah. first in the play. So I I applauded that. And and let, let's be a hundred percent clear that that putting massacre on a title, first of all, is genius. It fits yeah. with anything. It absolutely does. It fits with anything. Um, Actually, I might I might have another movie that you can add to that list because I doubt it's online anywhere. It's this uh, Thai. I think it's Thai. It might be Filipino. Uh, it's just called Massacre, but it's M A S A K E R. Oh, okay. No, I didn't look yeah. up. I only looked up Massacre with the traditional spelling. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's online anywhere, but but you can add that to the list. It's it's a pile of shit. There's currently three films with the title Massacre from 1934, 1956, and 1989, respectively. Um, but what's what's interesting about this this is my nerdy list maker thing coming out? But yeah, so first of all, Massacre. It's great if you want to sell a movie. Put the word Massacre at the end of it. It still yeah. works to this day. I was surprised, actually. I would have thought that most of the Massacre movies would have been made sort of end of the 70s throughout the 80s to kind of cash in on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But actually, the most use of the word Massacre as a title ending is in the 2000s. That doesn't surprise me at all because uh, that's when uh, the nostalgia for those older – I mean, for the handful of quality ones that came out – you know, in the, the 70s and 80s, uh, that's when the nostalgia for that was kind of booming. So uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that that massacre was used more than. Um, but yeah. Oh, and then lastly, <clears throat> the last one that I wanted to point out uh, is that there is a short. Big uh, Tits Massacre 2. No. But, but, no oh, yeah. So, so just to finish off on the Big Tits Massacre thing. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> You go well. The I, end. Of- I, I'm currently finishing off. <laughs> <laughs> so you you've gone you've gone. The last word of the title is going to be massacre. Of course. How which is going to sell the movie? How else do we sell the movie? What do people want? And the same guy who <laughs> was sat around the table back in Johnson 1983. In back, yeah. He just went big tits. <laughs> uh, big tits. Big tits. <laughs> You know. and, and someone went big tits massacre genius. Gee, so perfect. there's that. So the last one, which is a short film, but definitely, definitely needs to be made into a feature. I think you in particular, Mo, will appreciate oh, this. God. It's Please, called. I'm dying. It's called Mime Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's another one. Like, is it the? Is it like people pretending to kill other people? Right. Or is it a mime who's actually killing people? Or is it some, like, guy who really hates the circus who's going around killing mimes? Yeah. And then, see, it's, it, it makes you wonder. But, no, you're absolutely right. That needs to be a full-length feature. <laughs> so whoever – I hope whoever made that is listening to this so they can g- just get on that. Kickstart it. I'll share it around. I need to see that as a full-length feature. Definitely, definitely. So, yeah, I mean – um Check out the list. It's over at AfterMovieDiner.com. It's one of the uh, featured articles, so it should be very easy to find. Uh, but there's some great titles in there, um, uh, uh, like Bikini Swamp Girl Massacre. That's great. <laughs> like, that's fantastic. Um, there's uh, Frank and Pimp's Revenge, the Romeo and Juliet Massacre, which is a great title. Um, Fat Camp Massacre, which I think is great. Wow. Uh, there's apparently a movie being made out as we speak called Hipster Massacre, which I can't wait to fucking see that. And a big shout out to my uh, buddies over in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, my Pittsburgh peeps, uh, and uh, their fantastic movie, Jagoff Massacre, um, which is uh, available now online uh, f- to, for rent at like one ninety nine. which is, uh, there's a link to that on the, on the thing. So it's a great list. It's fun just to read. Um, and there's a little bit of an article beforehand about the joys of VHS. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, because it was the VHS covers of these massacre movies that kind of inspired me to write the article. So I wax rhapsodic a little bit about VHS and then we go into the whole massacre thing. So check it out. It's a great article. I think it's a great article. Uh, and worth Everybody checking. else thinks it's a piece of shit, but <laughs> I, I love it. It's no, a, 
Um, I'll check it out as soon as we're done recording. So, uh, da, 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 da. let me see now. We've got to go to some questions. Yeah. We, don't, we don't have a lot of great questions, but here we go. Okay, since John Carpenter has stopped smoking and begun smoking more weed and did a tour, is there a chance we'll get to see another movie from him or will he continue to play Xbox all day? I, I think the weed indicates Xbox. Yeah, without a doubt. He's. I mean, I would think that his uh, Doritos intake is going to go up quite a bit. <laughs> right. uh, may, maybe Mountain Dew as well. Uh, and I certainly imagine he, he is going to be poning some noobs in Overwatch or whatever the new fangled game is. Yeah, and I would imagine that we'll, we'll probably see more music from him. Um, I just... You know, he's executive producing this fucking Halloween reboot again. Oh, uh, uh, fuck. Um, which nobody asked for, nobody wants, and nobody gives a shit about. Um, so, I mean, I don't know whether that convinces him to get back in the saddle, but I don't see... Yeah, but honestly, how much work does an executive producer really do? Nothing. He takes money or gives Ex- money, either way. Ex- exactly. So, I mean, I, I just think that at the end of the day... Uh, he don't, I don't think he has any interest in it. Um, you know, I liked, I loved seeing him live. Seeing him live was amazing. Uh, it was clear that he had directed and edited the stage show. Um, like it was very clear that he was sort of in control of all of it, mm. um, which was awesome. And he hasn't lost his touch. I would love to see another movie just so that the ward isn't the last fucking thing he did because it's awful. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I would love to see... Uh, uh, I did a whole other article that was about why... Because Escape from L.A. is 20 years old this week. I did an article about why does everyone still hate Escape from L.A. because I fucking love it. I think it's an awesome, gonzo, mad, comic book, crazy B-movie. Can, um, can, I, can I confess something right now? Sure, go ahead. I've never seen it. Oh, wow. Fuck, dude. Check it out. Yeah. Um, Pam yeah. Greer plays a dude. Oh, well, in that case, I'm on <laughs> it. Uh, it's, tr- it's, it's, you've got to set aside the fact that they gave him $50 million to make the movie because it, <laughs> it, it came out two years after Jurassic Park, and yet it looks like it came out 10 years before in terms of <laughs> in terms of effects and everything. So you have to kind of... And it only has $15 million less than Jurassic Park in terms of budget. Jurassic Park was $65 million and this was $50 million. Um, and it, it, it definitely looks like a B movie. Like if, if someone goes, this was made for $10 million, you'd be like, fuck, this is amazing. But because it was made for so much in the mid-90s, that's why people had a problem with it. Um, I happen to just be able to watch it as like a mad gonzo fucking um, comic book movie, and it works like that. Um, mm. But I would, I would happily pay to see um, a third Snake movie with Snake being old and whatever. Well, you know, you know what? I mean, now now that Kurt Russell is basically out of retirement, he's back working regularly again. I mean, why wouldn't they do that? That'd be fantastic. Yeah, and I would love to either that or. But of course, we, of course, we'd get that. We'd still get that contention of of people on the internet be like, "You raped my childhood." Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, look, I, and I said before in my article, like, I would rather a sequel. Than a reboot, any day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Movie. Give me, you know, and that's and that's what people don't seem to understand. It's like, like, give me a sequel. That's fine. Like, that's why I don't have a problem with the Mad Max movie. That's why I don't. Have, I mean, of course, I wouldn't have a problem with it anyway. It's fucking fantastic. But, uh, you know, the was like, the original director. It's the original guy, like doing a fourth part or doing right. a continuation of the mythology or the whatever yeah exactly exactly it's you know as long as it's still sort of in the same kind of universe and the same somewhat you know con- continuity even if it's not it's not that big of a deal but i mean like make a sequel don't make a, a, a reboot yeah it's, so it, I, I made my yeah. point in the in the article that i wrote about it i'm like is john carpenter directing producing writing and doing the score is kurt russell playing snake Plissken? is he trying to escape from somewhere does shit explode? Is Pam Greer, Bruce Campbell, Steve Buscemi, and a whole bunch of other people in it? Yes, they are. That's all I need. Like I don't like it's. That's another escape movie for me. And I and yeah. and, and so yeah, I would like to see him do a a third one. Or if he wants to do something smaller scale because he can't get the the money that would be required to make something like that these days, 
then uh, him and Kurt Russell are what I want to see working together again, especially as you say now Kurt's out of retirement. Um, yeah. Ed Quillen asks, is there a group of films involving fast food, boobies, and blood you guys can think of to discuss? We kind of just did. <laughs> we just Yeah, spent... I was going to say, we, we, we really just did, yeah. Uh, either that, there's um, uh, Blood Diner, right? That's another yep. one. I don't know if there's uh-huh. bo- There is boobies in that, I think. Uh, I mean, does Dead End Drive-In count? Uh, Dead End Drive-In, kind of. Um it doesn't have boobies in it, but Don Dola's Blood Massacre kind of has uh, food and blood in it. Uh, worth oh, uh, yeah. You know what? Uh, Poultry Geist. Poultry Geist. Right. That's another good one. Um, but yeah, basically <laughs> anything, anything on the massacre list, I would imagine, would probably have some form of boobs and blood in it. Uh, and again, Hamburg and the Motion Picture has fast food and boobies. Not, not much blood, though. Yeah, I don't think it has much of anything for blood, but that's fine because I don't want blood in that movie. Uh, so Sloan McDonald asks, uh, what is the first porn you and Mo remember seeing? Not together, just in general. Um, and Ed Quill- Oh, it's, it's funny. It's really funny because I've actually heard the, your story for this several times, which is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, I don't, but I don't know if I've ever if I've ever told my story for this um, so I'm, I, and I do actually very much remember what my what the first porn I ever saw was. Go right ahead, dude. Uh, tell the story. All, all right. So back when I was a kid, I think I was like 11 <clears throat> when I discovered the world of pornography. Uh, I knew, like, I was searching for movies to watch, and I knew that my parents had like a stash of movies up, like the where their television was. Like there was a sort of like little cubby space uh, above their closet. Um, and they had like regular movies up there too, but like it behind the regular movies, there were, there were a stash of tapes and I didn't know what the hell they were. So I saw this movie called around the world with John Holmes and, um, me being 11 had no idea who the fuck John Holmes was. And so I pop it in and all of a sudden it's just like this chick getting railed. And uh, and so I sat there and watched it for a while and uh, like, oh, this is interesting. Hmm. Nice. And uh, kind of set me down, set me down the path. That's fantastic. Oh, I was saying, and uh, yes. yeah, and I had a, a bit of an obsession with the uh, with the French girl for quite a while after that. <laughs> um, and then Ed Quillen, uh, I mean, oh, sorry. Uh, to get my story about that, you have to um, go back to, I think, like episode nine or ten of the after movie diner. Uh, but basically I saw my first, uh, hardcore pornographic movie, uh, during a religious studies lesson when I was nine years old. Um, and that sounds, uh, it's one, of, it's one of the best stories ever. It sounds sick and twisted. It sounds like what some weird teacher took you aside and showed you porn. No, that's not what happened at all. It was another kids, uh, uh, like they had the porn from their grandfather's shed. Um, that doesn't sound much better. <laughs> Uh, but at least there were no adults there. It was just <laughs> all of us who were nine, eight or nine years old uh, watching this. Um, and uh, But the story is out there in the internet. So I'm sorry, Sloan. I'm not going to repeat it now because I want to wrap this up, but uh, it's out there to be found. Um, so uh, Ed Quillen follows that up. <laughs> and what's the first one you saw together and how many goats were in it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we haven't watched uh, porn four, together. Four goats. Uh, and there were four, four goats. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was uh, Glory Hole Goat Massacre, actually. Uh, yes, that was that's exactly what it was. Ed Quillen then asks, is there a reason why most recent horror films shown in theaters don't have any boobies in them? Uh, yes, because all recent horror films are shit. That, yes. Um, and also because... Um, I, th- I also because there's something uh, like exploitation doesn't play anymore. Like uh, the the one thing we've lost in the um, PC kind of universe in which we live now is is that the idea of boobs for boob's sake sort of doesn't play anymore. I think the last movie that had it in was like the Friday the 13th remake and everyone's fucking and boobies are out and everything like that. But that's like kind of the last one I remember it being in. And 
um, while I agree that, you know, we should be more sensitive towards um, uh, lots of different groups of people, like people shouldn't be homophobic, shouldn't be xenophobic, shouldn't be racist. I agree with all that. I think that when it comes to movies, especially genre movies, um, there should be a little bit more um, leeway in terms of exploitation, and we should go back to the golden age of boobs and blood i i agree entirely and i think that uh i think that one of the big movies to really start to kill off the boobs for boobs sake thing uh was like when the american pie films came out uh i feel like like that's when it stopped being sort of just hey there's boobs it's fun and and it became a little it, it sort of twisted it and became a little bit more lecherous and and kind of ruined the whole boobs for boobs sake thing yeah, I mean there were there were some there were some movies, but like, uh, and I you know I guess there's probably some underground movies that are still like putting a whole bunch of um, uh, boobs in movies. Like it still sells on the on the streaming and or sure, sure, to video yeah. circuit. I just don't think like the trouble is is all the big budget horror these days is fucking. The Exorcist of the Haunting of Connecticut of Emily Rose Paranormal Activity bullshit. Like, that's every fucking movie now is a haunted <laughs> fucking doll or a shitty Pretty haunted much, yeah. fucking house. And I'm like, ugh. Like, and the, the joke is, of all the 70s movies that, 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 that people go on about, Amityville Horror was, like, the most boring one. Like, so stop making it all the time. <laughs> Amityville Horror is incredibly boring. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. More more exorci- Exorcist, less Amityville Horror. Right, exactly. And now, the, oh, have you seen they're doing an Exorcist TV show where the Exorcist is young, sexy, and has three-day stubble because he's conflicted about stuff. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was a couple of the questions. We've got a couple more, and then we'll, we're going to say goodnight on this one. Mark McDonald asked a joke one, which is, what are your thoughts on Nietzschean concept of will to power, and specifically how does it relate to the current economic and geopolitical zeitgeist in the United States and Europe with respect to fascism, science denialism, and authoritarianism? Uh, he also said, what was the deal with Suicide Squad? <laughs> uh, but I'm not answering that because I haven't seen Suicide Squad. And the other thing is... Just- I'm going to answer the question, even though I haven't seen Suicide Squad. I'm just going to say I'm against it. <laughs> right. Uh, and Jim asked a good question, which is, you and Mo are asked to design a VHS cover for the lost classic, A Trip Down Dismembery Lane, without ever having seen the movie. What does it look like? <laughs> Hmm. All right. So there's going to be at some at, at, somewhere on there. There's going to be a severed head. Right. Um, boobs. Yeah. There's going to be yeah boobs without a doubt. Uh, <laughs> a hint of boobs. Clad or not. I mean, you you could. Right. Exactly. Like you could do like a uh, a sort of a, a I spit on your grave kind of thing where it's just sort of like a, a ratty t you know shirt covering them up. That's fine. Um, uh, there's going to be obviously a, uh, a, a a real lane as such, and there's going to be a big house in the background, probably like storm clouds, maybe some lightning. Uh, it's going to be hand drawn, obviously, um, and maybe like uh, a, a, a fat mustachioed bastard. Uh, maybe like like a Joe Spinell type uh, with like a machete or something. Yeah, Joe Spinell is perfect. That's who I would want to uh, watch in um, a trip down Dismembery Lane, uh, which is a great title. If that isn't yep. a movie, that needs to be a movie. Um, so that's that's a great title. Uh, so yeah, I would have yeah. There would be um, uh, maybe like it. Let, let's think about um, what it, it wouldn't be a machete or, a, or whatever. Maybe like a sickle, like a, like one of those farm sickles. Oh, okay. Because um, I want a different weapon, yeah, like a scythe. Yeah, like a scythe, but not like a, yeah. No, that makes sense. Like a hand scythe, not like a grim reaper scythe, but like a little hand scythe. 
like the Russian flag sickle. Yes. Um, and 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 maybe yeah. he's dressed all in like dark red. Like maybe he's like a communist killer or something. There you go. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking, anyway. But that's it. I think that's there it. is actually a really great. Uh, yeah, there there is actually a movie w- that uses dismember uh, in the title really well, and that's I Dismember Mama. Right, and what's interesting, I, I Dismember Mama, is that um, Jim Wallace, who normally does the show with me and the one who just asked that question, uh, when he was working in London years ago, actually found me the poster for I Dismember Mama, the original Italian poster, nice. um, and uh, brought it That's home awesome. and gave to me. Yeah, yeah, so I have that somewhere uh, in my vaults of stuff. Um, so that's very exciting. But Mo, uh, thank you so much, sir, for being yep. a part of this wonderful episode. Thank you for coming back on the After Movie Diner. Thanks for getting me out of a jam of not having a show with Jim this week. Um, and I've had had a great time, dude. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, you're welcome for all of that. And, uh, you know, you can just put the check in the mail and, uh, you know, we're, we'll call it even. Okay. Sounds good to me, sir. Good to me. Uh, stay, <laughs> stay heavily waxed and I'll be over there in about 30 minutes. I'll be oiled up and ready. <laughs> We're back in 2011. I find a movie going to see. A film by Jim and John Moose starring Iggy Pop and me. But when the show was over, I'd know where to go. So I'd end up in a bar, sipping my bourbon and feeling low. One night this wild looking guy called Frank came over and asked me why I looked so sad as I drank. I told him about my post movie lose and then I saw the light in his glass eyes. He told me to go to the after movie diner. I surprised you don't know. There's no place fighter. Come on now. John Crosswell, he's a man, he's a man with a beard and a man with a plan. Yeah, he is. With Jim and John and Adam Mark, tune in to Flash Goblet to start. Yes, and reviews, opinions, interviews, comedy and news, Don Dolor and his films and George Stover. At the after movie. Place to go. Oh, at the after movie diner. This where I go. Oh, that after movie diner. This one hell of a show. I just kill that rattlesnake with skillet pasta.